Thank, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Daniels, and I'd like to thank the organisers and the Institute of Medicine for having me here today uh, to talk about such a, uh, an interesting topic, and, and uh, thank you for being so on time this afternoon here. Today I'm going to be discussing the vascular effects of caffeine, but firstly, a little bit about myself. I'm on LinkedIn, if you'd like to link with me. I am involved in the HEARTS program. It's the Houston Early Age Risk Testing and Screening Program. And this program, actually, we're going out to schools in Houston and screening 12th graders or 6th graders for underlying cardiovascular abnormalities associated with sudden cardiac death. I also have a, my first cardiology book just published, and it's, also, it's on, available on uh, Amazon. Hello? Can some, did someone having problems? Oh, OK. And uh, I'm a marathoner. I've run 10 marathons, and I run uh, Houston each year. My prettiest marathon was San Francisco, and getting to run across the Golden Gauge Bridge was awesome. And I also enjoy doing media at, to help get the message out about important cardiology topics as well as health and wellness. And I will be available uh, throughout this conference to talk to any media if you would like to talk to me about my research. So today, I'm going to firstly discuss endothelial cell function, because I believe this is really important to understanding some of the results that you will see following that. <coughs> then I will talk about the fact that caffeine at rest appears to improve endothelial cell function. However, importantly, caffeine blocks adenosine receptors. And this then leads as a segue into the next section where someone who is having caffeine and then exercising afterwards appears to have reduced endothelial cell function. Also, I would like to describe the fact that energy drinks, interestingly, at rest, appear to decrease endothelial cell function. Talk a little bit about the research that I'm doing at UT Health and then have some concluding remarks. So firstly, endothelial cell function. So endothelial cells form the inner lining of blood vessels and they have both basal and inducible metabolic and synthetic functions, and they carry out multiple tasks, as you can see here in this cartoon. Importantly, in the vasculature, they, are, they carry out antithrombotic factors, vasomotor factors, and other factors. <coughs> so the reason I'm mentioning this is that normal endothelial cell function is really, really important to regulate vascular tone. That is blood vessel tone and variation. And it's important to realize also that at any one time, you know, minute to minute, endothelial cell function can change. And for the, the topic I'm talking about today, the important aspects of endothelial function are firstly, vascular tone, secondly, thrombosis, which is the ability of blood to clot in the artery, and thirdly, the barrier function of endothelial cells lining that artery and preventing the bad guys kind of causing damage to the artery underneath. Now, it's a bit of a balancing act as well. So we know that <coughs> on the one hand, with normal endothelial cell function, you have vasodilatation, so the artery is getting larger. You have thromboresistance, which basically means preventing blood clot or making the blood thinner. And then you have anti-adhesive qualities. And I, I would the analogy I use is kind of the Teflon coating on a frying pan is like the endothelium. When the Teflon coating is working really well, things glide by the pan, just like the artery wall, and things don't stick like platelets and that. And so this is really important. And the molecules that are important for this normal endothelial function appear to be nitric oxide, prostaglandin I2, endothelium-derived hyperpolarizing factor, and bradykinin. Now on the other end of the scale, you have abnormal endothelial function, which is manifest by vasoconstriction, or smaller arteries, pro-coagulant effects, so wanting to blood clot, and pro-adhesion, so things wanting to stick on that blood vessel wall. And the molecules important here appear to be renin, angiotensin, and endothelin-1, and others. So why am I talking about abnormal endothelial function? Well, we know that abnormal endothelial function is important not only in the short term, but also in the long term. In the short term, abnormal endothelial function in the presence of during stress, so for example, someone exposed 
to cold or some other stressful stimuli or with certain exposures, for example, exposed to cigarette smoke or cocaine could impair the ability of those arteries to normally dilate. And so that potentially could result in a supply-demand imbalance. You know, the stressful situation, fight or flight, heart is beating harder, needing more blood flow, but at that same time, it's not able to open as well. And this potentially, in the heart case, arteries, this could lead to a supply-demand imbalance leading to ischemia and possibly cardiac arrhythmia. We know also that endothelial cell function in the long term, if it's abnormal, it can lead to hypertension, atherosclerosis, and the commonest killers in our society, cerebrovascular disease, uh, coronary disease, and peripheral arterial disease. We also know that improving endothelial cell function is a desirable goal. And how can you do that? Exercise. That's a great way to do it, and I recommend you try to do that each day. Smoking cessation, certain antioxidants like vitamin C, flavonoids, which are present in dark chocolate, cholesterol lowering, particularly statins, omega-3 fatty acids, glycemic control in diabetes, L-arginine, and because we know L-arginine is a precursor <coughs> to nitric oxide, which I'll be discussing in a little bit, and ACE inhibitors and ARBs, to name a few. So firstly, I'd like to discuss the fact that caffeine at rest appears to improve endothelial cell function. And this is the pathway whereby we think it does that. So we know that caffeine increases intracellular calcium, and this in turn stimulates the expression of endothelial nitric oxide synthase, or ENOS, which then stimulates the endothelial cell to produce nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide then diffuses to the vascular smooth muscle, which lies just underneath the endothelial cell, and results in vascular smooth muscle vasodilatation. We also know that caffeine can bind directly to the vascular smooth muscle cell receptors and through similar mechanisms result in vasodilatation. And this picture here shows caffeine concentration on the x-axis and then degree of relaxation. And th in this particular case, it was vascular smooth muscle cells from the human aorta in vitro. And you can see with increasing concentrations of caffeine, there was an increase in the relaxation of that particular artery. So what about the in vivo studies, that is the actual ones done on humans, not in the beaker or test tube. So these two studies looked at just that. In this first study, which involved 40 individuals, 33 of whom were male, average age 53, who consumed pure caffeine, 200 milligrams, and then they were tested 60 minutes later. And the test they used was flow-mediated dilatation of the brachial artery. And what they found was that resting flow-mediated dilatation increased 10% after caffeine. This next study, which involved 10 males, younger than the first study, this was average age 27, and they had a slightly higher dose of caffeine, 300 milligrams, and they were tested 60 minutes later. And this time, they actually looked at the response of the, end of, of the, the vasculature to both acetylcholine, which we know is an endothelium-dependent vasodilator, and also sodium nit nitroprusside. And they used blood flow measurement with a strain gauge plesmograph. And what they found, firstly, that resting forearm blood flow was not affected by caffeine. However, resting forearm blood flow response to acetylcholine was increased by 25%, suggesting that the endothelium is very important in the vasorelaxation effect of caffeine at rest. This is a really important thing. Caffeine blocks adenosine receptors. And why is this important? Well, adenosine receptors are present throughout the circulation. And in particular, in most parts, they vasodilate or make the arteries larger so that blood flow can increase more. So for example, in the coronary arteries, 
the adenosine 2A receptor results in vasodilatation and also the A2B in the aorta. And we know that caffeine competitively blocks all of those adenosine receptors. And the mechanism is probably that caffeine blocks those receptors and then that actually results in a compensatory increase in adenosine by the body, which then stimulates circulating chemoreceptors and other receptors leading to an increase in sympathetic tone, catecholamines, peripheral vascular resistance, and renin secretion. And we can see those effects, for example, if we measure blood pressure. And we, for example, after uh, 300 milligrams of caffeine, you can see blood pressure increased uh, by uh, seven and three millimeters respectively. So now, let's put these two things together. Caffeine, and then exercising after being exposed to pure caffeine. And this appears to decrease endothelial cell function. Now, regarding endothelial cell function, I'm a, car a sports cardiologist, and so I'm particularly interested in myocardial blood flow. And the, the studies I'm going to show you relate to measurement of myocardial perfusion by positron emission tomography, and also flow-mediated dilatation, which is an accurate me measure of brachial artery endothelial cell function, which we know is a very good surrogate for coronary artery endothelial function. So how good the brachial arteries and the arms can dilate correlates very nicely with how good the coronary arteries can dilate. So these, here are a couple of studies illustrating this phenomenon. This first study included 15 subjects, five of whom were male, average age 58 years, who received 200 milligrams pure caffeine and then were tested 50 minutes later. And they used myocardial perfusion reserve measured by positron emission tomography. And what they noted was that exercise-induced myocardial blood flow response decreased 14 percent after caffeine ingestion. So this is someone taking caffeine, they're exercising on the bicycle, and they're measuring blood flow, and it's reduced. This next study involved 18 individuals, 11 of whom were male. These were younger individuals, 27 years of age on average, taking 200 milligrams of caffeine and doing a similar protocol. That is, measuring them while they were doing bicycle exercise. And in this particular case, these younger individuals with the same exposure and the same testing had an even more significant reduction of 22% of myocardial blood flow. This study looked at 10 individuals, average age 30, and they had a slightly higher dose of caffeine, 360 milligrams on average. And in this case, they measured forearm blood flow at baseline, and then they had the individuals do uh, bicycling for 55 minutes, and they actually measured at every 20 minutes during the study using a venous plesmography occlusion technique. And at rest, there was no effect on coronary, uh, on, on forearm blood flow. However, during exercise, caffeine attenuated the usual increase in forearm blood flow by 53%. So again, caffeine plus exercise appears to affect blood flow. I'd now like to turn to the energy drinks at rest, which appear to decrease endothelial cell function. And the reason I'd like to talk about this is, as you've already heard today and as you've seen in the literature, there's been a lot of concern and attention to teens and younger children who are able to go into the store and consume energy beverages. In, in fact, you know, in Houston, where I'm from, I've had, I'd screened some of the children, and it's not uncommon, you know, that they will, when they're playing soccer, for example, on the weekend. You know, when I was youngster, we used to have oranges, you know, cut up or bananas and things at the break time. Now, you know, some of them, uh, they'll have a can of Red Bull or Monster at the half. So this is something that's really concerning and that we, we do see, uh, as opposed to the, the other physician who commented earlier, we are seeing quite a lot of youngsters coming into our emergency room running into problems when they have consumed energy beverages. Also, uh, as you're aware, there was the lawsuit filed against Monster uh, for a wrongful death in October of 2012. And then, of course, um, the Dr. Earhart and colleagues organized a wonderful letter to the FDA commissioner uh, just this past March, also asking the FDA to look seriously into this problem 
because of these concerning reports and, and in both personal accounts as well as uh, case reports and speaking to others in the community. So I think it's important for us to discuss this briefly. This study looked at 50 healthy volunteers, 34 males aged 22 years on average, and they actually measured two types of endothelial cell function. One was adenosine diphosphate induced platelet aggregation, and the second was the reactive hyperemia index, that is how the artery is able to dilate uh, by peripheral artery tonometry. And they tested these individuals before, and then one hour after a 250 mil can of, and they used a sugar-free energy drink in this particular study. And here are the findings. Firstly, the endothelial cell function as measured by the, measuring the platelet function, there was a significant increase in platelet aggregation following energy beverage consumption of 13.7% compared to basically no change in the control. On the reactive hyperemia index, that is how the artery is able to dilate, there was a significant reduction in its ability to do so following the energy drink, whereas there was a, a non-significant difference from baseline in the control. And then finally, as you've, not to be, unex not unexpected, was the blood pressure was higher on average in the energy beverage consumption group. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the research we are doing at the University of Texas Health, which, uh, and if it wasn't for the University of Texas Health, Memorial <coughs> Hermann and Harris uh, Health support, we would not be able to perform this research. So the study is called SHADE-1, which stands, uh, and, and the shade, by the way, it's because, you know, we're using kind of shadows, like ultrasound, kind of that's how I came up a little bit with that name. So it's the study of heart effects from adults drinking energy beverages on endothelial function. And you can see there, I was in fact the pilot study. That's me, you, yours truly. They're getting my studies done. And here's the can. This involves Monster 24 ounce, which is, is the can, actually this was the can I actually drunk for that pilot study there. And we are, what we are doing is we're doing a measurement before, then chugging down the Monster can, just like they tell us we can, chug it down, drink it fast, and then we are re-measuring endothelial function 90 minutes after that. And here is the, the results. These are my own results here. So at rest, this is my brachial artery diameter here, 0.42 centimeters. Then we perform flow-mediated dilatation using a cuff, the standard cuff occlusion method. And, and measure, all measurements, by the way, are, are being done strictly per the Minnesota guidelines by, by a Minnesota-trained person. And you can see that my artery does dilate at rest to 0.45 centimeters. Then I drink the, the monster and re-measure the artery 90 minutes later. And you can see now at rest, 0.43 centimeters, and then with maximal flow media dilatation only going to 0.44 centimeters. Now in fact, we measured my brachial artery endothelial function by FMD not only at 90 minutes, but we actually also made a measurement at 50 minutes. So we have 0, 50, and 90. And here are the, the results just graphed here. Here is the time here, and here is the percent flow mediated dilatation. And you can see here that at baseline, at rest, my artery increases it in size by 106.5% from 100 or 6.5 percent from 100 to 106.5. This is at 50 minutes. It's already uh, reduced somewhat. And then at 90 minutes, it's uh, again reduced down even further. And, and interestingly, you know, we've been hearing today a lot about caffeine. And many people that uh, I've read in the literature believe that after a consumption, most people will peak their caffeine levels at around 45 minutes and some 60 minutes. Although there is a range, but most people believe that the peak is happening at around about the uh, 45 to 60 minute mark. And, and I think it's interesting because it appears, again, in this energy beverage, which you know, not only has caffeine but has other important ingredients, that the maximal effect that, that we measured was in fact at 90 minutes. And so this makes me believe 
that what the commissioner stated earlier is perhaps there's something about these that, that these are different beasts to coffee and other caffeine delivery. This maybe there's something in them that is either affecting the pharmacogenetics kinetics or dynamics of caffeine, or perhaps there's something else in these. You know, maybe something that uh, the guarana, the carnitine, the glucuronolactone, or whatever, that's interacting somehow with the caffeine and having more deleterious effect on the endothelial cell function. So my conclusions. Firstly, in healthy individuals aged 22 to 59 years who consume 200 to 300 milligrams of caffeine, as measured by indirect tests, have improved endothelial cell function and vasodilatation at rest. We know that caffeine blocks adenosine receptors. Maybe it's causing supply demand ischemia. In healthy individuals 21 to 71 years who consume 200 to 300 milligrams of caffeine and then perform aerobic exercise one hour later, by indirect tests, they had reduction in the endothelial cell function as measured by a, a reduction in myocardial blood flow. And then finally, in healthy individuals aged 20 to 47 years who consume energy drinks, by indirect tests have reduced endothelial cell function at rest. And so more research is needed. We need to talk about both the effects and mechanics of caffeine and energy drinks, and to assess the safety of high-dose caffeine and energy drinks in the younger, in the caffeine naive, and those who exercise one to two hour later. And in the six cases that I'm aware who have had deaths associated with energy beverage con consumption, the ages of those individuals were between 12 years and 19 years. So I believe that this is possibly a vulnerable population. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, John. Um, our next speaker is Jeff Goldberger. Jeff uh, is a practicing clinical cardiologist uh, focused on electrophysiology. Uh, he's uh, practiced at Northwestern for 23 years. Um, and he'll be discussing caffeine and the risk of arrhythmia. Jeff.